They said it couldn't be done. Ladies and gentlemen, we did it. I'm here to announce the world's first Ableton Ethel Studio converter. There are limitations, but we'll go into everything that it can and can't do in this video. So back in December, I launched Jukebox, which is this website, and you can generate project files and, and song templates in different styles of music. You can download it to a, a, a DAW that you want to open it in and open it up from there. Wow, look at that. It's the exact same thing, but in here now. But now we have a whole new section that is the convert page. Oh, you can hover over. That's where you can upload a, an FLP file or an Ableton, the ALS file, and that will convert. So we dragged it over, converted it. And it was relatively quick to do that. Here we go. Let me open it in Apple Studio as well so you can compare it. It has all the notes in the exact same place. If you look at Apple Studio, bar 29, that lead, that's where the lead comes in, and in Ableton, bar 29, that's where the lead comes in. This bass line, you can see it has like that wave and that filter on. And if I go to the bass line here, yes, it also has the, the same wave and pattern and everything because it's, it's the same preset, the same patch that's just been moved over into the Ableton file along with the, the notes, the pattern name, and any audio clips. Let's talk about MIDI, because I'm pretty proud of that. Because there's lots of exceptions that happen between Ethel Studio and, and Ableton. We begin at 1 on the timeline, and that's the same for Ableton. We also begin at 1, but with Ableton, you can actually go negative, and you can have like a negative timeline starting at minus 2, and even have notes that begin at minus 2. That can never happen in Ethel Studio, because you can't go before 1. So the only way to keep this would be to like have to shift everything up to like three or something and then have that note starting at one. So one becomes the new minus two. Plus then you have also notes that are not even like visible, but are still there, still part of the pattern. All of those things have been taken into account. So if I just save this, there we go. It looks exactly the same, but did it retain that information behind the, the pattern? <gasps> yes, it did. It, it, it's still there. And the cool thing about this as well is that it's clever. Okay, let's say you have this. You should think of these maybe as the same patterns in FL Studio because they, they both begin at minus two on the timeline. So really these should be identical patterns. And so we've, I've managed to account for that as well. Hey, look at that. Beginning at 11, let me just check, yep. So the clip begins at nine but that's just, just empty space that we're not using. So that's why the note actually begins at 11 because that is where the, the note begins. And that's the same here. If I check to the pattern things, hey, there's only one chorus because it's reused it. It's not gonna be like if I had a hundred of these, it would make five different patterns or something. Also what's I think pretty important is looping because Ableton doesn't have patterns, they do have loops. So if you just wanted to like loop this part and I'm just gonna keep the rest of the notes in here just to make it even more tricky. If I loop these notes and then drag that out, it should just repeat. But looping doesn't exist in Ableton. So what I've had to do is just read like, okay, how long is it looping for? And then repeat the pattern. So I would have to just take this part of it and just like duplicate that over and over and over. Even if it's like, like an unfinished loop like this, for instance, and then convert that. Yeah, it's just looped that part of the, of the MIDI clip and even like cut off the last one because the last one in Ableton also wasn't like a full clip. Cool. I have a sponsor for this video and that's Captain Chords. It generates chord progressions. And you can choose a scale. I want to be in Lydia now. and choose a different chord progression like this one. And change the timing of it to get a different rhythm. If you want to change it up, you can still change the, the chords from here using different scale degrees. 
and adding on different extensions. You have a bunch of built-in sounds to use. Or you can just send it out. I'm sending it out using the, the, out, the MIDI port. The, or you can just grab the, the MIDI that you've created here and then drag that and put that into a synth. And look at that, just, the plugin just disappears when you grab it. If you're interested in this plugin, I have a link in the description with a code, Dylan, just, just the word Dylan, and that'll give you 10% off of the plugin if you use that. So if you're interested in that, then go ahead and check it out. Let's say if I have a loop sample, let's say 127 BPM, this loop, isn't in that tempo. So for it to get in tempo, we have to like stretch it, we have to warp it. Usually how I do it is if I hold on shift, I'll drag the end, or you can type in the tempo you can see here. It is almost exactly 150, but I'm just gonna type in 150. And because we're in 127, then of course it's gonna play a lot slower than 150. If I made this really slow, you start to hear it start stretching out. Let's go. There we go. It stretched. You can see it's like the exact same length. And you can see like it has a time stretching thing. This is the tricky part is the warp markers. You can have like tons of them. You can stretch this one sample out, make that really big and this one really small. You can't do that, not with the audio settings here in Apple Studio. To really like get an accurate thing like this, I would have to like make multiple a clips and then stretch each one individually and please don't suggest that as a, as a possibility because I might actually do it and it would be total insanity but if you just use one warp marker like one right at the beginning and then just type in the tempo there or like I mentioned before hold it down and stretch it to where you want it to be that's what I've built it around to because that's the normal way of doing that so as long as you stay in the normal way it won't be a problem but if you do have like multiple warp markers and you really still want to use that, then you can just consolidate the audio file. The converter will just treat it like any other audio file and that will just convert over normally. So that's also an option too. Now, I guess we'll start coming to limitations real soon of what it can and can't do. For instance, I'm using these stock plugins, Fruity Delay and Parametric EQ. Because these aren't VST2 plugins, there isn't any way to convert them without having to create its own little converter thing that would like take these settings and plug it in and convert it to an EQ8. It would be durable, but it doesn't exist just yet. And there are other plugins that don't carry over yet, either audio unit plugins and VST3 plugins, but that's definitely on a to-do list. You can also just freeze the tracks, which is really simple to do in Ableton. So any, any, any synths that you don't have, that will just turn into audio and convert over easily. And in FL Studio, that's possible in newer versions as well. Then you'll notice here, sample offline. So this is because it's from the FL Studio pack. And those have a lot of problems. A lot of the samples from the Ableton pack won't load properly in, or they will load in, but they just sound like white noise. If they come from a pack, the way FL Studio saves them, it saves them as a uh, custom variable has a variable in the name and you can like even look over in Ableton and we'll see that percentage percentage FL Studio factory data. That's a location that FL Studio knows, but of course Ableton doesn't really know what that location is, so you can't find it. In general, if you're using like a modern version of, of FL Studio 20.7 or higher, then if you use any other samples from other sample packs, it should be able to find them. But if you're in an older version or for some reason it just doesn't, then what you can do is save and export this as a zipped loop package because this will collect all of the samples together. Save that to a zip and then I'll just unzip it. Then when you go to convert the FLP, it doesn't matter if it's this one or the one from before, but what is important is that you turn on relative path and this will just tell Ableton to look for the file in the same folder as all the other samples. So if you put it here, then that's where it's going to look for, and that way it can find it. If you're going from Ableton to FL Studio though, that isn't necessary because by default, if FL Studio can't find the samples, it will just look in the folder anyways. See, yeah, that's where this 909 crash sample loaded in as white noise. That's nothing I can really do anything about. It's just the way the, the FL Studio audio samples seem to work. For any other sample, 
absolutely fine. And then, you know, if you want to send this, then it's also very good for collaborating because then you can just zip that all up or zip the folder up, send that to somebody who has Ableton and then they'll immediately have all the samples too. And you don't need to worry about that. If you're going from Ableton to FL Studio, what you need to do is like collect all and save all your samples to one place. So then it, it will make a, one of these like funny looking map things and then it'll say samples. And this is where all your samples are. They're in here. Sometimes you'll have more, like if you have recorded or frozen samples, they'll be in different folders and you'll just need to like collect all of these and put it into the, wherever the FLP is as well. There isn't any support for automation, none of that yet. That's gonna be pretty tricky, I can imagine, because once again, it's two different DAWs that handle it very differently from each other. Slots, yeah, if you have more than 10 effects, then it's just going to stop after 10 because they don't go any further than 10 on a mixer track. Fader volumes. The way FL Studio and Ableton stores these values is different. I don't have a perfect conversion between these two things just yet. As you see, 0 0.3 and 4.4. .4, so that has become 0 0.4 instead of 0 0.3. So it's off by one. And then 0.4.4. .4 .4, that's been converted to 0 0.4.8. So again, not perfect, but close. And even if you have different values here, there's still a lot of areas where this can go, you can get quite different mixes and volumes. For instance, if you have a utility boosting things up, there's no utility here yet. And also gain inside audio files, if you gain it up here, there's, I don't have a way to convert that over just yet. So it's gonna sound not identical just yet. Also no colors. So everything that converts back just turns into this yellow. It's a little annoying, I guess, but maybe I can add like a gradient or something so it's a little bit more diverse. Uh, FL Studio, here is a big issue that hopefully will be fixed in the future, but for now, FL Studio doesn't save the BPM of a sample, which you might think is kind of weird because, well, like, how do they know how to stretch it? But what I believe it does is that it, it scans the length of the file and then uses that to like determine the BPM of it, essentially. So when you convert it from Ableton to FL Studio, it converts fine, not a problem. When you convert it back to FL Studio to Ableton, that's where you'll get an issue. But I have a way to fix that. A little hacky, but it works. If you just type in the tempo, I know this one is 150 BPM. Just do a full number like this, 150 BPM. That'll work if you save that then it knows, hey, this is 150 BPM. Files that you're using might already have the tempo in the name already. And that's great because it should read it, fortunately, if it has BPM in the title. Yeah, there we go. And that's, that's read the tempo, 150 BPM. Look at, there it is, 150 BPM. Yeah, hacky fix, but there was nothing really I could do to fix it. What, eventually what I'd like is to upload zip files and then if you have the whole entire zip file, then it could just read that information. Oh, it's this length long, that wave file that you have in the zip, and then use that to determine the, the BPM going from FL Studio to Ableton, things like that. And then also be easier for keeping track of all the files. To use this, you'll just need to make an account and, and verify the email. That's the only requirements. Then you can use it for free. You'll have limited amount of downloads. If you subscribe, you'll have an unlimited amount of downloads, plus no file limit limitations. That was it. There was a lot of work to do. Not gonna lie, a lot of work. Pretty much waking up, working on this nonstop for a long time. So I'm going to take a bit of a break from straight working on the on the converter, but it'll be back. And in that meantime, I'll probably be working on just other Jukebox features as I think uh, there's other like really cool things here that I still want to add more genres, more, more DAWs, more features. I'm pouring myself some tea because I need to slurp. Oh Lord, he's about to slurp. Mm. Uh. If there's any problems, just let me know. You know, if you get any error messages, I want to fix it. Like I said, I'm not going to be adding too many features just yet. I will in the future, definitely will, because it's such a cool idea that I'm not going to just, oh, not work on this anymore. I think it's going to be really cool to see where this is in a year from now, but I will just be making sure that nothing is broken. So I want it to already be in a usable state that's pretty stable, and I feel like it is at the moment. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have uploaded it and shared it. Let me know how, what you think about it in the comments. I hope you enjoy using it. Hope you have fun and um, hope you have a great day.